Hello, my friends. It is your disembodied pal, Troy. And, you know, I've been threatening to do these drafting table recordings, and um, and you have come through. We've got so many folks looking forward to sharing, sitting down and just having a conversation about creating characters or the characters that they've created. And, uh, you know, I, I love sitting down and having the conversation, and so we started the drafting table. And the idea is we get to meet new friends, uh, become a little more acquainted with old friends that we've known for some time, um, and uh, and just get into the nitty gritty about character creation in mutants and masterminds, and uh, and that's what this is about: freeform conversation, dialogue about the importance of the character and the methodology. And today is. Uh, uh, no different, uh, um, but I'm excited about it because, you know, you may have heard me refer to this, uh, individual as Glyph, um, because of their username, uh, or AKA username, but they're coming on today to talk about Raquel Luna, who is AKA Spibby. And, uh, I am really looking forward to the dialogue do join me in saying hello to our friend, username. How are you? Hello, I'm doing well. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about your character. And we have got um, just a ton to cover. First of all, tell me a little bit about you, your Mutants and Masterminds journey, um, how long you've been playing, where do you play? Um, do you GM, you know, give me all the details. Okay. So hi, <laughs> I'm username. Uh, I have enjoyed mutants and masterminds third edition for quite a few years now, at least since 2018 or so, and have been enjoying role-playing and GMing on the freedom first server in discord. I uh, have a peculiar reputation on the server as we have a vetting system where you have to submit your characters so that it's approved for play on West March's server. I have uh, up to this point, 42 vetted characters and am presently <laughs> holding the record for most characters. But I really enjoy role-playing. I enjoy GMing as well. It is by far one of the best systems I have ever used in role-playing because you can do so much with it, both with your characters and in story. Nice, nice. Okay, well, so um, when you're GMing, um, what, do, you, do you have like a long-running campaign? Do you, talk to me a bit about that. So as part of the Freedomverse and a West Marches server, we have uh, one... Uh, long, continuous story that all the GMs contribute to. And it is quite the experience and uh, in that you can be part of a really rich canon, much like a comic book uh, canon, like DC or Marvel or Image Comics or independence like Astro City, where it's often like different characters or different super teams, and each have their own stories, but they all connect to each other. Got you. Okay, so I, I like that. Now, when you're GMing, do you inc incorporate stories or build off of existing stories as um as they've already been told or in the world, like do you, and also, you know, maybe I'm um, learning something new um, when you're, how much impact can your individual story that you're in have on the world at large? Like, are there limits? Can you like say, now there's a giant crater in the middle of in this, in this freedom verse version of Eminem. So we, as GMs do our best to respect the canon uh, as it is written in the books. Uh, one 
thing that we try to maintain is that, yes, we use canon characters and we use canon settings like Freedom City and Emerald City and the many wonderful places that you can find in Atlas of Earth Prime. Yeah. But the one tenant that we have is you can do what you want so long as you put your toys away. That means that uh, you can use canon characters and canon content uh, so long as they are maintained uh, in a respectful way. So many, Comment. yeah. So a lot of characters have uh, duked it out with villains like the Battle Brothers. Uh, we've duked it out with Conundrum. He's a very popular one for mystery games. Uh, and uh, even some of the PCs have like can. Uh, developed uh, relationships or adversarial uh, relationships or even working relationships with characters like Conundrum uh, and have fought against Shadow. And so you can, you can have that, but you can't really alter the uh, canon characters. A good example is that we have a character by the name of Princess Silverwing, who frequently comes uh, and participates in various uh, games as a canon NPC. And some of the player characters uh, have um, interacted with her. Uh, one of my own player characters is a Time Paradox clone of her. But, ah. uh, yep, uh, Gravitea. <laughs> uh, there's a long story behind it, and that's just it. Her creation came about as a continuation of someone else's story. Uh, someone else uh, uh, was having some difficulty where, you know, they uh, used an interdimensional portal within themselves to absorb a whole bunch of evil spirits. As and you then do. In order to, yep, as you do. And so in order to cure him, we took him to Greece to try and find Hades, and so that we could, you know, kill off that character and then bring him back from the River Styx uh, to the mortal ah. realm. And uh, as a result, uh, I was playing as Princess Silverwing. She uh, grabbed the string of fate from the fates, I believe they're called. And then uh, she developed a Time Paradox clone that I use as a PC for Claremont games, because why not? You have a team why hero, not? might as well have them enrolled in Claremont. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> the open secret of uh, the Mutants and Masterminds setting. It's a preppy school for superheroes. It's just most people don't know that it's for superheroes unless you're a superhero. Uh, right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I mean, you know, that old saw, I mean, you know, sometimes you gotta, gotta go, you gotta travel the river sticks and you gotta do all that stuff. Um, you know, just another day in the life, if you will. Um, now let's talk about your character because your character happens to embody one of my favorite mammals. Um, second favorite, my first favorite mammal, honestly, is humans. Um, I do, I do enjoy human, but, uh, but a humanoid raccoon boy that's pretty darn close to to second if not near first uh very very close if uh maybe neck and neck um but we're talking about let's get this share going here um this is spibby yes this so is talk, yeah yeah talk to me about spibby uh, uh aka uh well raccoon Raquel Una, <laughs> it was so funny when we were talking about this. I was like, now how do you, I really wanted to get the pronunciation right, but it is Raquel, <laughs> Raquel Una, AKA Spibby. Um, talk to me about the, the G, like how did this character come about? Uh, pretty distinct. So there's quite a lot to Spibby that came about. So I live out in the country in the middle of the Canadian wilderness and as such have frequent wildlife visitors like bears, bobcats, cougars, coyotes, deer, eagles, magpies, osprey, and raccoons. Uh, okay. 
pay us a visit. And so I, I also really like raccoons. I think they're very neat. Uh, I, and so I always wanted to make a raccoon character, but even as a PL8 character, I didn't know how to finish them. Like I figured out what powers they would have for senses, uh, things like wall climbing and things like that. But uh, I, I wasn't sure how to finish the character once I uh, put those powers there. Uh, I tried to avoid the standard fare of making an animalistic melee fighter with natural weapons. Like oftentimes yeah. you'll have like a werewolf character, even one of the canon characters for Emerald City, I believe, is a werewolf who fights with claws. And that's neat. But I didn't want to quite do that with uh, this character in particular. Also, I wanted to avoid making them a uh, weapon master so that you know, they didn't appear too similar to a particular guardian of the galaxy. Fair enough. I was going to ask if that was some influence, but yep, yep. Yep. Uh, so the way that I came about uh, with this character is I tried some wordplay and I was like trying like raccoon, raccoon, coon. And it's like, I thought of telekinesis. <laughs> and the rest of the build came through. <laughs> I see that right here. Telekinesis. I like that. All right. So um, Spibby is a, 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 a rune humanoid. Now, is, is Spibby from another planet or from another dimension? So neither of those things. That was definitely okay. discussed during character creation. And one of the uh, advice that I was given was like, oh, yeah, you should you should just make her a uh, uh, humanoid raccoon from a planet of humanoid raccoons or an extraterrestrial species that just happen to look like uh raccoons on earth and it's like sure. yeah i could do that but like i i always find it like a bit of a difficult trope of like oh there's an alien species that just happened to evolve and fit exactly my character concept it's like mm, i yeah, want something yeah. something grounded and so i was thinking for a while and thinking for a while and like my uh background or one of the works that i really like was uh teenage mutant ninja turtles sure uh, and like the mutanimals and i thought you know that's pretty cool or i thought of like maybe the x-men like you have uh some interesting characters like uh beast or wolf spain and i thought like that's pretty good but, like, I don't want to say, like, some sort of toxic ooze fell off a truck and hit this sure. character on the crosswalk or didn't want to rely too heavily on the mutant gene because it's kind of there, but it's not. And there's also the canon Silver Storm. And I thought, like, that would be good. But then I wasn't sure about the character's age because I wanted to make a teenage hero. Right. And so... Uh, I I was thinking and I was thinking and I was like, all oh, right, there's uh, cosmic radiation, good old Fantastic Four as sure. a source of influence. And I was like, hmm, how do I work in cosmic radiation? And I was like, I know uh, part of her backstory is that uh, she is an intern at this office and she... Um, uh, helps herself to a uh, donut that she finds in a waste receptacle and she eats it, of course. <laughs> uh, Got to throw in that Seinfeld reference. And right. it's like, and she doesn't feel well. And so she goes home uh, to lie down and unbeknownst to her, she has uh, raccoons in the attic. And uh, just at that time, there is a experimental aircraft in the atmosphere or spacecraft and it opens up a hole in the ozone using uh an experimental like drive and of course the uh, there's no risk like uh most people aren't in a suburb so even if there is a radiation <laughs> leak into so their little. home uh yeah. fortunately the 
as the radiation comes down, uh, is filtered through uh, her attic with the raccoons, and it bestows upon her fantastic powers. So she obviously wins the lottery for powers because she develops a nice suite of psionic powers, much like Sue Storm or Jean Grey. However, okay. uh, because there's raccoons in the attic, uh, something, <laughs> something extra is thrown into the mix. And so it's like... Uh, one thing I love about the X-Men is like you get really cool powers in one hand and then a really awful drawback in the other. Right. Right. Well, and it's one of the things that that um, I, I've i fallen in love with um, for some time. I mean, one of the things that really just drew me to mutants some masterminds in general is the complications, you know, and, yes. and that I just I love that. I think it is. It's just a really interesting opportunity to to get your role play up. You know, and and to and to really dig into it. So, um, yeah. Let us do this. Um, talk to me about. Let's just go through and 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 describe. Okay, so so Raquel Spibby is eighteen. Yep. Okay, and so um, not the tallest. Um, so nope. sort of a kind of a medium build, if you will. Um, dark brown eyes gray brown pelt now uh is spibby always spibby so that's the thing uh, i guess one place that we can start off with yeah uh, for character creation is the complications because sure uh, that is actually like the crux of the character so spibby wasn't yeah spibby was human that's the thing was a normal human teen, was an intern, had her life kind of planned out and a little bit humdrum, but still planned, which sure. quite frankly is rare nowadays for people, Spibby's age, people my age. Uh, but oh, and me too. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm very young. Uh, same here. <laughs> Uh, I am but a young student and forever student, it seems, but still living, loving, and learning. So, right. <laughs> yes. With Spibby is, yes. She is always uh, as this uh, raccoon humanoid mutation. Uh, one of her complications is that she has conflictions about hero because on the one hand, she can help people. On the other hand, she has this awful appearance. And to top it off, not only does she have this awful appearance, but her own psionic powers disrupt her life. She has, or at least started off with, uh, as she started her superhero career with uncontrolled teleportation. She would uh, teleport uh, up to 4,000 miles with good old rank 12 uh, teleport and usually end up in Freedom City because that's where most of the games are run on this server. And just whenever she's like having breakfast or uh, was in bed or was going out, then she teleports and ends up in some sort of dangerous uh, situation or some sort of lab or facility wherever the games are run. That's and so her life was interrupted, and now she is trying to still make the most of it. But she, she's still dealing with the loss of having a normal life, being a normal right. person. This uh, is great. I, I just want to I want to dive into this real quick because I really enjoy that you you plout. I would imagine if you were to live your life as a raccoon and you're living a you know you're you're doing. You look like a raccoon, but you're not always the trash panda or the, you know, I mean, I, I bet that those jokes would get tiring on any just sort of you or I, you know, but uh, I, I love that it is reflected in the complications that, um, you know, that there is a, uh, the constant association with garbage and just being, you know, being that creature, um, you know, and and does she reflect back on her on her uh, donut eating 
past or or is she yeah. sort of doesn't like to refer to the you know doesn't like people to refer to the garbage thing but is sort of a, a raccoon so that's the thing is that spippy at first didn't believe that her powers were psionic in nature she yeah. thought maybe she ate an enchanted crawler and so that <laughs> she got her powers that way and is somehow cursed and only later found out like no powers don't aren't magic they're psionic and she's like well what do i do with that now it's like <laughs> like trying to cling to answers and identities uh as a way of explaining but no and that's the thing is she doesn't even have like a proper hero name uh she doesn't want to be referred to as Saikun because, you know, it makes it sound psycho. Uh, doesn't right. want to be like Raccoon Girl because she's more than a raccoon. So she just goes by a childhood nickname that she has, Spibby. I still haven't figured out why Spibby. Uh, the name just kind of came to me of a random collection of syllables. And so that's how she has that name. Uh, but yes, that's the thing is that she is still trying to cultivate her identity, her sense of self, and trying to figure out her place in the world. The, the entire thing about Spibby is that uh, basically a random freak accident that was highly improbable to occur uh, happened to her. She, she won the lottery. She was struck by lightning, and this is her life now. Uh, right. I even... In other plots that she has been in as a player character where there was like alternate timelines and alternate versions of herself, I even asked the GM and said, hey, uh, in this universe that you're setting up, uh, can we have it that this Bibi is just living a normal life? And they agreed because that's just it. She has to now find meaning in an arguably random and cruel universe, that it's up to her to do the meaning making, that this wasn't necessarily some great fate or grand design by an extraterrestrial who uh, looks at Earth with favor. It's like, nope, here you are. It, these things happen. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And uh, what about Spibby's family? So Spibby... This is very important. Spibby has a loving and supportive family. She is not an orphan. She, her family is trying to make the most and trying to explain, like, or trying to help their daughter along uh, as best they can. I didn't add the relationship complication for a very simple reason. Her parents are in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, much like me, uh, that <laughs> they, they're not going to be threatened by most villains in either Emerald City or uh, in Freedom City because it, they're just not there. It, it would take a very uh, enterprising villain to go out of their way to bother this poor, uh, this poor teenage hero's uh, family. And so sure. if they do, I'm, I'm sure then uh, the GM will give me a hero point in game when that comes up. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I could, you know, one of the things I love as we start to travel down the, the story of these characters is that, you know, they, as Spibby is wrestling with becoming a hero, I could see Spibby becoming a hero of, of note to the degree that the villains are starting to take you know take account of all the things that Spibby's doing and you know that could thereby endanger her family but i love that the, you've left that open as an opportunity to explore much like Spibby the name um you know there's a story there you know that there's yep. like but but you haven't quite opened the door on that or explored it yet and i think that that's really fun and that's one of the things i love about uh, character creation in Eminem is that there's really an opportunity to say, I'm going to leave that open. I'm going to leave that door open so I can walk in and handle it. And, you know, it could be a really fascinating, deep adventure that uncovers the memory or, you know, sort of allows for you to sort of uh, encapsulate it in, in the character uh, sheet. But right now it's a sort of, 
opportunity. Um, and I, I love that. I love that a lot. Um, all right, let's look at these specific complications. So we've got conflictions about being a hero. That makes perfect sense. She's like, I, look at me. I'm a, I'm a raccoon human. How do I maneuver through this? I, you know, I want to be human again. That's the desire to become human. Um, yeah, that would be a pretty intense complication as you're sort of, especially when you're young. I mean, it's already difficult. You're, you know, you're just trying to feel human let alone to become an, an entirely, you know, different kind of human with a pelt, uh, difficult. Um, and, and so it, yeah, I love this has not settled on her proper hero name yet. And I could see maybe just sort of her trying on new monikers or, or sort of hearing as people, you know, the people refer to her and go, Oh no, no, that's not, I love that side chick sounds too much like side chick. <laughs> mm. That just is a great facet of uh of the character development and this humanoid raccoon and psionic powers the you know i sometimes we as people don't feel weird until we're told wow that's weird and you're like oh okay well this is just my normal me how you know and i could see uh, an 18 year old you know humanoid raccoon feeling pretty normal until someone says i you are a raccoon that's talking, that's moving, that's teleporting, that's doing all this stuff. Um, I love that. And, you know, and it blends in so well and interestingly into the motivation, which is acceptance um, and doing good despite going, do I want to be a hero or not? And, uh, and you know, the, <laughs> I feel badly for her in that raccoons and, you know, garbage are just pretty pretty synonymous not their fault really um but uh now talk to me about this teleportation power uh just unpack that for me a little bit um she yeah. does she do you know is there more depth to what fires off the teleportation power or is it sort of an unknown as to you know why that's happening or when uh you know what what triggers it Yes, so there is actually uh, quite a lot to this, uh, okay. both story-wise and uh, mechanically, or like the metagame. So in addition to her teleport powers, she has precognition and postcognition. And so uh, one of the things, or one idea that, uh, Raven has suggested, who is an excellent member of the staff and a veritable pillar of our community in the Freedomverse, is that Spibby's clairvoyance allows her to see multiple possibilities and randomly teleports to intervene and prevent those adverse outcomes. So like something subconscious in her senses this danger or connects with like the psychic plane and is like, oh, if I am not here um, playing a part to prevent this, this terrible thing could happen. And so her teleportation uh, basically sends her there, which is usually Freedom City for some strange reason. <laughs> Who would have thunk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but now the metagame aspect of this is that uh, Spibby is one of my newer characters uh i think uh somewhere in the 30s uh of when i among my many <laughs> characters and and i learned i tried to learn and as you said earlier about leaving open doors yeah. that is entirely the uh, approach i tried to have with spibby was that she's all about open doors in that the teleport allows her to uh, basically appear in any situation in like most of North America within 4,000 miles from, um, so Quite she a distance, can appear there. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, she, because of her, uh, that so Raven-esque uh, precognition and postcognition that's also uncontrolled, uh, she suddenly gets visions. So the GM can also uh, give clues 
uh, or details that they normally wouldn't be able to give because players have to often directly interact with something to learn about it, is that, no, here's an opportunity. Just say, okay, Spippy, you uh, use your psychometric-like effect, you touch this thing, and now you learn about it and share about uh, where it's been. And so that's just it, is that I made Spibby specifically to help the GM uh, tell a story. Like her. Oh, I like that. Yep. Is that the design was to try and make a support character who also supports the GM. And so her teleport ties into this is that she can teleport anywhere. And eventually, uh, through many games and many GM points that I invest. Uh, yeah, that's one thing about the Freedom Verse. Uh, one incentive to running games is that you have floating PowerPoints that you can put into any character. And so, Ooh. yeah, Bibby is my Wait, most let me, invested character. So let me let me clarify. So when you're saying uh, so when you GM a game then you get uh, a PowerPoint that you can then apply to your your character. Yep. Uh, a character of your choosing. Wow, that's great. Now, uh, can you give them to somebody else? No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because <laughs> uh, I was going to say, gimme. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, you can give characters away. I mean, but... Uh, but then well, how, does, you give your character happen, away. Yeah, yeah. Does that happen quite a bit? Then Ooh. I mean, do you, do people have uh, have people created characters for other people? Um, you know, do, is that an unusual thing? So funny you mentioned that. Is that I am part of the uh, Hero High faculty uh, because I've played the game for quite a while and GM the game for quite a while. I learned the system and learned how to make characters and you know making making so many characters for this uh <laughs> eventually I, i'm well practiced in the very least yeah and so i've helped people quite often by like okay have you considered this so i jot a few ideas down in hero lab and uh send them to create the rest and so that's the thing that you could make characters for other people but it's then their responsibility. Uh, at one point, uh, when I had left the server, I gave my uh, one character away and all the points. Um, and then uh, years later, came back and said, hey, Hi. I have my <laughs> character back. <laughs> and like, th thankfully, I, I got that back. That's like my second most uh, invested in character, Ophidia, who is a serpent people hero. They didn't start off a hero, but they felt that <laughs> uh, it was better for their health and better for their career uh, that they did hero work instead of villain work. And so, yes, I have a serpent people villain turned hero mm -hmm. who lends their magical expertise as uh, Empress Arcana, uh, the emissary of the occult and strange, uh, who is oh. disguised as a human hero uh, because, you know, monstrous complication, like Spibby. <laughs> right. I, I do like monstrous characters because I feel like it, it adds that extra uh, bit of narrative. Uh, but for Spibby, uh, She's still presently dealing with that appearance. And so, sure. yeah, going back to Spibby, one of the things is that she had uncontrolled teleport for a long time until yeah. I bought it off. Uh, that eventually she earned enough uh, PowerPoints that she eventually learned in game how to better control her teleport. And uh, the way that this also worked is that she had many mentors. She uh, had a mentor of uh, one of the prominent psionic heroes in our server, uh, ended up like teaching her for like a few sessions of like, hey, I know we have these psionic powers, but 
you need to learn how to use them effectively so that you can yeah. better serve the public. And yeah, that was great. That was good role playing. And it helped to justify the mechanical growth, which I think is like really important. It's like, yeah, you can spend PowerPoints and just add stuff over time. But when you uh, have that narrative pull and explanation of how and why you got him, it's great. Like he has a lucky coat. And I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things she has is that eventually she started wearing this jacket with an enchanted and burned uh, ace of spades up, up her sleeve, literally like sewn into the sleeve that's enchanted. Uh, one of uh, her good friends and mentors that she uh, had been on several missions with uh, tragically died in a game. And like his entire house burned down. And I said, hey, uh, after the session, can I have her rummage through the remains and like pick up a burned uh, playing card? Because, you know, gambling theme. And he said, sure. And so that's like her uh, commemorative memento that she keeps uh, as a memory of honor. Yeah, Yeah. that is, uh, I I love that. I I knew that there was something special there. Um, And so that explains the, uh, an ace up one sleeve immunity Mm -hmm. that is, yeah, I love this. So the burnt remains of an enchanted ace of spades. That's great. Um, Now the, uh, here is a question that I have about when you decide to. So, can a GM look through a a resource of characters and, and reach out to you and say, "Hey, um, you've got you've got this phenomenal character, Spibby, and I, I would love to to have her make an appearance because she has." powers or or there's something about the creation of that character that really fits well with with what i'm trying to do do you get sort of headhunted like that for for adventures i mean for me personally not as often as i'd like i mean you Fair think enough. three two characters people would reach out to me more but no uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, but, but, but you're open to that i mean that that is yes. that is a okay that's great and uh, frequently on the Freedomverse server that we're part of, and you're always welcome to join, uh, that we often run spotlight games, is that often a story will be crafted around a character or a super team to help uh, tell an interesting story with them, uh, perhaps exploring something in their backstory or explore a complication, or yeah, even if they have like a set of powers that might be suiting. Uh, when I was running a game, I used uh, Spibby as a GM PC and just had her uh, run support um, as a background character. And all the characters who applied were psionic uh, because they were learning how to use their powers effectively. And the characters who were teaching were also player characters it's like hey uh your character is one of the most loved and celebrated on the server uh how about a nice uh teaching session and a couple of them agreed and it was great and in that game the two teachers butted heads because they had uh differing views on how to use powers uh for instance one character was uh very inclined about using mind reading uh, to learn more information. Another one said, no, that's illegal. You shouldn't do that. It's an invasion of privacy. And so that came up in game. And the consequences of those things came up in game. And it's fantastic. And that's why showcasing characters can be really good. Yeah, absolutely. And and so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the freedom verse discord server. And, um, it is, gosh, I want to say it's over a thousand people, right? And, and so basically, and you can get there, you'll see the link at the bottom. Um, we'll put a, a QR code as well. 
um, here in a moment. But um, so, yeah, discord.gg slash welcome to Freedom City. And basically, it's an opportunity for people. And it's active. It's so active. I just, I'm a lurker primarily because there's only one of me as sort of the, the community nerd for Green Ronin. And there are so many people on the yeah. server. And so, um, but, uh, but I highly recommend that folks go check that out. Um, uh, really great. Um, it, it, it's a safe place. It's a fun place. It's responsibly run. Um, there, there are opportunities to get it as up to your eyeballs in, in lore and, and role playing for me and some masterminds and a great system that helps you onboard and kind of learn different ways of engaging with the community. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it just in general. And what I love the most about it is, you know, mutants and masterminds will live on forever. But if one day a meteor should strike and only hit green Ronin HQ, um, the server can, I know, right. Um, <laughs> no, uh, we need to reinforce the building. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put a note out, uh, to the, uh, to the reinforcement team, um, to watch out for meteors. Um, but, uh, the, this whole community continues to grow and continues to, and it, and it's got such strength. Like you said, you, you know, sometimes given our the seasons of our life, um, we, we can devote a lot of time to, you know, engaging in our hobbies. And sometimes we got to step away for whatever reason, uh, yeah. for a myriad of them, but to know that you could step away and then come back and engage and say, Oh, Hey, about that character and still be able to engage with that person and know that the, the beat goes on. That's really exciting. Um, and, and so it, it does sort of create this, this world where, and you know, I talk about this in uh, in the previous uh, episode of the drafting table, where it it is an exciting record of the experience that you have role playing, and your story unfolds that you can read again and again and go back and go, oh hey, did I rem did that happen or you know, and and uh, and I love that about the whole experience. Um, talk to me about what is your what are some of the things that you really value about um, the, you know, Freedom City Discord? So I'm really excited to share this because I'm really excited about the server. It It is such a positive and really inclusive role-playing community. And yeah. uh, speaking a bit to my background is that I have a background in social work particularly in gerontological social work. So that's uh, working with older adults and their families. And I can say with some, with quite a bit of certainty actually, that this server really speaks to uh, social justice, inclusivity, and developing a really positive and healthy and supportive community and supporting each and every person that uh, comes there in a uh, respectful way. And so I'm really honored to be part of the community because it's just one of my favorite places to hang out. And yeah, there are some seasons in life where you have to take uh, a break from your favorite hobby. Is that uh, oftentimes as a student, uh, when I have a major assignment or I have a major uh, project or exam coming up, uh, quite often the GMs will like understand that and they'll be understanding if I may have to like uh, leave a game is that, yeah, these things happen and that, yeah, but to be able to come back and see the narrative and see where people have gone um, since you've left and since you've returned, it's really nice because it's a really nice community in general. And so I great, highly recommend it. Yeah. So great storytelling, great stories to read, uh, great opportunities to learn and to, because mutants and masterminds for the uninitiated can be a little overwhelming. It can be, it can be a little bit on the, 
uh, mathematological side of things, and and you know it can seem that way rather, but yeah. you you really get to the heart of the story and character building, and you know I, listen, if I were actively if I had the time, um, I would be creating just as many characters as you, my friend. I, I just love it. I absolutely love it, and I can see why. You know, even just the act of creating a character starts to build up a an expertise and a depth and a and a striving to get even deeper and to create. You know, in on one hand, uh, economically create a character so that you know all of the so that it serves a kind of a purpose, um, uh, but to also sort of engage with people that are doing kind of the same thing and uh, and and have fun while doing it. And then, like you said, to be able to step away and come back, um, you know, the discord for freedom city is the place to be. If you are looking for, um, a, a place to learn a safe place. So you can come in being an absolute dummy like me and just start talking to folks. Um, you know, I think a, a testament to a pook and the other leaders and, and folks that are moderators in that community, uh, for what they've built. Um, and, uh, and while, uh, I, I also like that you were talking about how um, there, the idea of you know put your toys away, make sure you clean and sanitize them, and that they're back you know where they need to be, uh, so that other fe- other folks could use them. Um, that, that it still maintains a really nice and tight connection to the overarching canon. As it comes out through the, you know, through the mutants and masterminds releases and stories and things, um, uh, I'm so I'm so glad that we were able to kind of dig into that for a little bit. But I do want to get back to this character and talk about some of these other um, powers that you've got cooking here. Um, how do you want to? Because there's a page on this that I really want to get into, which I think is a which I I think might be a reflection of its creator. Uh, and I'm fascinated, but I don't want to go there just yet because I feel like that's going to be a l- little bit of a combo, um, uh, and I'm excited about it. But in talking about powers, where do you think is a good spot to to start here on the character sheet? Should we are we right here and, and yep. we can okay all right. So we talked about we talked about Ace up one sleeve. We talked about the telekinesis a bit. Um, uh, walk me through this. Okay, so. <laughs> powers, uh, powers and advantages, uh, and skills, the crux and the crunch of the system. And for the uninitiated, or for those who are interested in mutants and masterminds, come to the server because the most difficult part of learning the system is character creation. And but that's why the drafting board can be so useful as well as. Uh, coming into the server and talking to people experienced with the system is that we can help you make fancy characters. Now, on to the fancy. Uh, (laughs) One thing that I really developed over time making characters was that when you're on a server with thousands of people and like thousands of characters, is that you have to find ways of... Uh, finding a way that works for you and to be able to make a character that, yes, there may be like hundreds of paragons, but how how do you play as this paragon? Everyone can, or you can have like six players and all of them have flight, but how does it look for this person? And for Spibby, one of the unique contributions that she has and that you may have noticed on her sheet is that she normally doesn't roll for anything. I, one thing that I really like in Mutes and Masterminds is that there's quite a few ways to approach something. So she has a form of telekinesis and eventually uh, I, through the points that I earned, I had it that she has a perception range or increased range two as the extra is that she can look at something and lift it. She can uh, look at... Uh, an opponent and grab them. Uh, She doesn't have to roll. They just have to roll their check. Now, the disadvantage of that is that you can't use maneuvers uh, like power attack or accurate attack. It's just 
one and done. It's uh, you you can't or if you use it for something like a team attack, it only adds a plus one rather than a plus two or plus five uh, to the total bonus. And so there are drawbacks to not being able to uh, roll is that you have guaranteed success, but at a cost. And so for her telekinesis, or telekinesis in particular, I added the split extra. So in order to target like multiple opponents, she has to reduce the DC for each one. And so that's one of the few extras that you can add to increased range uh, two or the perception range. Uh, one of the other key things about Spippy is that she is peaceful. She is a kind-hearted person and having gone through this difficulty where she's a raccoon person is that she is now like uh, really sensitive to the needs of others. She, she was before, uh, but, but now even more so. And so part of that is that she actually doesn't have much in the way of offense. Uh, she doesn't have like uh, much in the way of like mind frying or even uh, mind control or uh, even mind reading as you might expect uh, other tele telepathic characters to have. Instead, she has uh, her one damage power is sleepy time is that uh, she has a damage power that is using the target's will uh, and that she has the area extra as she sends out this wave of psionic energy that puts enemies to sleep thanks to the sleep extra. Now, initially, she also put herself to sleep uh, as well uh, because it had side effect two, uh, uh, sleep whenever using this power. Now, part of this was that she is a peaceful person. She would rather talk things out whenever she can. Uh, she has uh, entered a coliseum in one game along with other groups of heroes. And there was like all these waves of enemies and this person who was like laying out their plan is like... Uh, okay, heroes, I'm going to have my minions fight you. And then uh, after you vanquish them, you'll have to fight me. And then Spibby uses her ultimate effort persuasion, spends the hero point, and is like, uh, can we talk this out instead? Because, you know, um, <laughs> we don't really need to fight. What's bothering you? And so we found out what was bothering her and we skipped the entire combat encounter. And that's normally <laughs> what she does. And so when she had this uh, power that induced sleep in others, part of the reason why she induced sleep in herself was because she wanted to avoid combat. She wanted to avoid having that responsibility of participating and potentially harming other people because that's not really Spibby. Most of her powers, like her telekinetic barrier, her create power, were meant to protect people. We're meant to protect civilians from uh, getting hurt, uh, protecting herself and protecting others. Even her move object was meant to like just uh, move people out of the way, uh, move them to safety, teleporting people to safety. Uh, that was her thing. So her sleepy time, eventually she had to learn how to participate in combat. And eventually she realized she was jeopardizing her own teammates by falling asleep in combat. She put herself in danger and therefore put uh, her teammates at added risk. So she, through the gameplay, uh, learned that she had to do more. And so she consulted with two of her mentors and realized that, yeah, fighting sucks and fighting is terrible, but sometimes you have to know when that it's the last option and have to do that option. So eventually I bought off the side effect too. 
and that she now stays awake when she uses that power. Um, so she eventually even she learned how to concuss things with her telekinesis because I really like Stranger Things and it's a really cool looking power. And so <laughs> eventually, yeah, she had to learn how to uh, participate more in combat. And so uh, reluctantly, but now she does it uh, as a last resort. And so that's just it. Her character sheet and uh, the change log that helps me track of all the uh, point spending is a reflection of her narrative growth and her experience in learning from others. I have a question for you about that. When you are working with, are, how much of those pieces of the puzzle did you sort of say, "Hey, this is going to be the this is going to be the the adventure where I learn," um, you know, or where 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 Spibby becomes. A little more, if not comfortable, resigned to the notion that you know that sometimes you gotta you gotta duke it out, or was it something driven by a plot point, another character, another hero saying, "Hey, you know, this is what's up. You know, time time for some growth, kid. You know, talk to me about that those decisions." So there is a lot of agency, uh, both on the server and in the system. And so as a player, uh, you really, it's usually up to your call. And, it, and for Spibby in particular, it was usually brought about by self-reflection following a session. And like uh, at one point we had to fight a living island. And she used this sleepy time power and she fell asleep, but uh, she fell off the flying island after using that power to give it a headache. Uh, and so one of her teammates had to rescue her as she was falling in midair. And so afterwards, it was more of like, you know what, after giving it more thought, I need to do something about this. A lot of it really is like self-reflection and the in-between phases between games. Uh, one other feature that we have on the server that's incredible is uh, role-playing lounges, is that, yeah, a lot of stuff uh, and stories are worth exploring that aren't covered in sessions. A yeah. lot of the games are one shots or stories or campaigns that the GM has their own idea, but to pick up the pieces, yeah, is often best in lounges. And that's where she often had really critical and important conversations with her mentors and her friends and where she uh, really grew were in those in-between moments, in so those backstage moments. I like that a lot. So a lot of times when people are, putting together the the backstory for their character, it's just sort of in their brain it happens. Or, you know, or they they sort of create those those connections. And uh, But what I love about this opportunity on the Freedom City Discord is that you can literally just, in, you can engage with people and have a storyline and have a, you know, and, and, and have some of that fun and backstory that is, I think both enriching creatively, but also it gives you a little bit more. It's it's like those synapses have connected. You know what I mean? Like the, those that they're they're firing. They're you know they're not just sort of a um, sort of a thing that you can hand wavy wave about, but that they're an actual impactful, engaging um, situation with other heroes, you know, that, that, you know, is a lot of fun. And now a lot of people might l think about that now in tabletop role play games. Um, I think that there are probably a fair amount of people who are like, yeah, no, that's cool. I, I get that. Um, there are probably some folks who are watching this that they're like, wait, what you get together and you have a, a role play. Um, explain that just a little bit, the process specifically as it relates to engaging with that kind of opportunity on the freedom city server. So another way 
to think about it is that as a role player, we often think of ourselves as actors on a stage. But in reality, we're also uh, partly playing the role as writer, director, producer, especially if you're in like paid games uh, at a table at like a convention, is that you have some say about how you want your character to be portrayed and about the stories that you want in and the tone that you want to play. Like one really useful uh, technique for both GMs and players is the red card. If something is really troubling or upsetting or might be inappropriate in a game, it's like, say it. Like, yeah, you have the, or you should have the agency to be able to say, no, I, I don't like this particular uh, direction. Can we perhaps rewrite it? Is that you have uh, agency, especially in mutants and masterminds, and especially on this server, is that we're all here to collectively tell a story. Yes, there is definitely gaming element, and there is the rolling of dice and the gambling and having fun in that way, but it's usually to tell a satisfying fine story for all of us. Right. Right. I like that. I like that. And so when, um, so just thinking about the mechanics of that, do you pop in and say, Hey, heroes, I need some heroic moments. Does anyone want to jump in and, and, and have a conversation? Like how, how do you, how do you embark on that? So there are a couple ways is that one that, uh, definitely describes like putting up the advertisements for games. It's like, yeah, you're looking for players for heroic moments. Uh, you, as a GM, present a scenario and you want your players to be able to solve it. Uh, as a player, uh, in-game, uh, there are a couple ways you can definitely do that is like teamwork, team effort, team yeah. attacks. These are moments where... Uh, groups of players definitely shine and be able to uh, showcase like how impressive uh, people can be working together. The uh, teamwork makes the dream work uh, is a phrase <laughs> sure. that is, is a phrase that is often uh, used on the server because that's the tenants that we adopt. Uh, as for like as a GM, if you want your players to shine, uh, one way to do it is skill challenges. Is mm. Skill challenges are really awesome ways to get players talking about their characters, doing the impressive things they're built for, and doing it outside of combat. It's like, okay, skill challenge. You're looking for a missing person. Uh, what skills do you want to use to help uh, contribute to uh, finding them. And it can be investigation. It could be perception and tracking. Uh, in Spibby's case, it could be perception using her precognition or postcognition, or I could spend a hero point and use uh, uh, Inspire. Uh, she has the expanded luck rules. So I get a free use of Inspire because it's part of her concept of having like the that's so raven uh clairvoyance of like hey plot is happening yeah Mr. yeah G uh gm can you share us uh some part of the plot and that's just it is that uh spibby is made to help make storytelling easier she's a support character uh, she has things like teamwork, jack of all trades, and improvised tools just so that she can help people do impressive things. Is that. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yep. Like it, it, a little teamwork goes a long way, especially in skill challenges. And it, that's just it. We're not here in silos of just showcasing how our characters are impressive on their own. And that is also a neat way of storytelling, but it's often used as a basis for then how they later come together and to solve uh, the impressive thing. Right. Is that even in uh, solo movies for superheroes in recent Marvel 
and DC films is that often heroes are working together with other heroes is that you're doing something with someone else and being are uh, having a synergistic effect. I like that a lot. And I do like that you created this character with the, with an eye towards supporting the GM's vision and the, you know, and, and sort of those pieces of that. And I think that it's very interesting too, to be able to create a character that both through their weaknesses and their strengths can lend some real texture to the storytelling mechanism as a whole. And that this is, you're talking about this, you know, that yeah, a Spibby as a, as a support character and on the meta, you know, also, you know, a, a vessel for better storytelling, more refined storytelling, or, you know, uh, opportunities to move things forward in a, in a healthy sort of uh, vibrant way. I mean, I, I really, I really love that. And I can see, and this is, I got to tell you, my friend, um, there are moments, uh, so we've done this now, this is the third time and we've got about 70 million more to go. Um, but, uh, but I'm excited because, you know, we get into sort of the cosmetics of, of, you know, raccoon girl and uh, all of the pieces, but then you start to get to know the person behind the character and what you were hoping to create and, and facilitate. I really see it. Um, this is that moment for me where I'm just like, aha, the, the uh, motivation of the human behind the hero and how those two things are kind of married together, um, uh, symbiotically connected and, uh, and what you hope to accomplish, you know, that to me is, is really the crux of this whole drafting table experience is just, I feel like this is a, a really phenomenal opportunity to walk through your view on life and just in general, sort of your approach to handling and, 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 uh, supporting and, and really augmenting and amplifying just this role play, um, in the mutants and masterminds space and, you know, uh, directly in the, um, discord for, uh, uh, gosh, I always, I, I always want to say, I, for some reason, I was, <laughs> this is just a goofy thing for me, but I always want to say spatula city, but you know, just because I'm a nerd, uh, <laughs> uh but of course, reference. Yeah. It. Thank you. I'm glad you pick up on that. But I listen. So if I ever say spatula city, you know what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about something else. Uh, I'm talking about the freedom city and the freedom verse. Um, so we have been talking for about an hour now. Um, and, and I, I feel like there's more to cover, the is there anything more related to sort of the powers and and those things that you want to dig into before we move on to the thing that I'm dying to get into? There is one thing that I'm really uh, keen about, and it's uh, both regarding her powers and her advantages, and it is also inextricably tied to the Mutants and Masterminds Third Edition system. Fair play is that fair oh. play is a really important uh, tenant of uh, our server and is a really important point about character creation and playing in games is that mutants and masterminds is a system where you can unquestionably do anything like without a doubt i am playing as a raccoon uh humanoid mutate with psionic powers who just really wants uh everyone to get along and is kind-hearted I can do that in this system. I'd have a more difficult time using fifth edition. It's not impossible, and it's probably more likely with like uh, <laughs> Pathfinder or maybe uh, Fate Accelerated, but Mutants and Masterminds, like undoubtedly flexible and wonderful system. And because of it, you have to uh, dial things back both as a GM and as a player because it is very easy to break things. Uh, as you may notice in her uh, powers, she had, or in her psionic powers, uh, she can detect minds uh, with her senses, but she has a second set of senses that allows her to use a standard action or has the concentration flaw to be able to penetrate concealment. Uh, she can detect 
whether there may be uh, someone else with a mind uh, in or on the other side of a wall, and which is definitely good for search and rescue. But I had to add like a little quirk that says she she has the accurate extra, but she can't use it in combat because that would be really unfair. Is that yeah, she has uh sense ranged uh attack with her telekinesis, but we don't want her to be a bathroom mentalist where she can <laughs> right. participate in combat. Uh, without any risk to herself, like in another room. Like that is something we definitely try to discourage because if there's no risk for your character, then maybe they shouldn't be really in that story because it's all, a, we're playing in a game rolling dice. And even though I use a character that I try to avoid rolling dice, I still want them to be, you know, at risk along with her friends is that she is there to support them and that means being a target for attacks too and so yes it's that when making this character and over time like uh coming to different decisions of like what is a good advantage or uh what is a good flaw uh different things like that uh, is definitely reflected in her build. Uh, you'll notice she has a lot of skill mastery uh, advantages. She has a lot of ultimate effort because if I don't need to roll it for that particular uh, scenario, I don't have to. But uh, I can only do that if the stakes aren't very high for skill mastery or I have to spend a hero point for uh, ultimate effort. Is that That's the thing. That's the... Uh, cost that I have to pay for not uh, taking the same risk of rolling. Interesting. So, so when have so when you've brought Spibby out and people go, wait, 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 you're not, you know, the roll. D does that throw them off a little bit, or? Uh, no, thankfully, because they know that I'm using ultimate effort. And yeah, and, yeah. And here's the thing: is that GMs are one uh, familiar with the sheet when you apply to a game because they're supposed to look over it. Uh, and if they didn't look over it, chances are I've played with them in a previous game. So or they know I've what even, to expect. Yeah. Or that I've even messaged them and asked them, hey, this character has this aspect about uh, them. Uh, they can see into the future. Uh, can I use that character uh, in that game or use that aspect? And they said, and oftentimes they'll say, sure, because there are limitations. Even with her precognition and postcognition, it's uncontrolled. It's up to the GM when it comes up. Unless I uh, spend like a hero point and inspire to justify having a clue, or I use my expanded luck and spend my luck point to use that. Um, Gosh, I sure like that. Real quick, I just want to just interject. I really love that you leave a hook out there for the GM to be able to a lever, another another opportunity to add texture to the story that impacts your character, but is already ready made, and so you know how to react when that's happened, and to be able to get that those details. And the GM goes, "Oh yeah, right. Maybe I can do. I can push that lever now to help tell my story." I love that. I love that a lot. Mm -hmm. That was definitely uh, something that I cultivated over time and that really uh, I incorporated as part of her design. And basically, as I learned more about the system, it's reflected in her sheet. Uh, like she has uh, expanded luck inspiration. She has expanded luck instant counter. She can... Uh, in one game, she interrupted someone's teleport because she threw psionic energy into the mix and prevented it. That's just it. And then it showcases more of the system because it, spending a hero point or expanded luck point for instant counter is really cool narratively. <laughs> and, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and as a player, like being able to like put the kibosh and uh, the villain getting away is really good. And is it a, um, is it going to stop the entire uh, combat encounter? No, no, not at all. Um, yeah. Like 
you've only stopped them for that one turn. They could even use extra effort and do it again. But you made a really good effort that you otherwise normally couldn't do because normally you can't really react to something on someone's turn, which is understandable for fairness of the system. But again, yeah, like it's really cool when it works. And yeah, she has things like ultimate effort persuasion checks. But the thing is, is that yes, uh, mechanically, yeah, she may get like a 28 uh, on that result. But I, as a player, then have to come up with a really compelling argument <laughs> from the point of view of this raccoon humanoid mutate teenager from Canada of why, <laughs> why the villain should maybe reconsider what they're doing. And I have to really uh, come up with clever ways. And it doesn't always work. Uh, in one game, she was trying to persuade Goana. Hey, Goana. I know you're trying to escape from this lab that you were prison of for a long time. Um, maybe can you not do it with by <laughs> killing us? Um, maybe we can find some other way for you to get out in a positive way. And it, it, it stalled Gowana, and that was great. Um, we ended up fighting anyway, and that was sad for Spibby. <laughs> but that's just it, is that these things are powerful, but only to a point. And that the GM can still and should tell the story collectively as they see fit and as makes sense. Is that, yeah, it doesn't, it, it makes sense that she can make the argument, and it can make sense that she stalled him, but it might not really make sense for her to win the day uh, through that. Right. I, I like that, and I think that there's something really healthy in the, these things make sense, my opportunity to to at least make the case. It does take some time, but maybe it doesn't necessarily work, but it's a good shot anyway, and, you know, there's some, there's some stalling time. Uh, I... I I enjoy that quite a bit. And I think that, you know, like I was saying there, it, there's something healthy too about just understanding sometimes you're not going to do it. Sometimes it's not going to work. Um, but that's all part of the unfolding story. Right. And one thing that you can be sure of is that in this space as a character, the failure is more an opportunity for growth than it is. It's not like you're going to just die. Mm hmm. You know, it, it's an opportunity to sort of, you know, unless that's your storyline um, that yeah. you're, you know, the, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Adding to that, and this is important, yeah. in Mutants and Masterminds 3rd Edition and on the server, uh, death is very rare and difficult to achieve mechanically, is that unless you are uh, reached an agreement with the GM, more often than not, your character will survive their encounter somehow and continue to play another day. Now, again, there are rare instances where characters died, just like a couple of Spibby's mentors, God rest their soul. But uh, that's just it, is that the, then these big events happen, is that we lost some of our biggest, like, and uh, well-known and well-loved characters, and it affected the whole server because it's such a rare event. It makes death have, like, more effect, whereas in, like, uh, D&D, sometimes you could just keep throwing sheets at a situation and, it's like, <laughs> right. hide behind the body of dead bards. Uh, right. <laughs> the, the pile of dead bards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that's... That's interesting and important, and I think also just another testament to the special place that, um, you know, maybe we need to have a, a, a third Mutants and Masterminds um, program just called, you know, uh, the, you know, let's let's call it the Welcome to Freedom City program, um, because I think something real special uh, is going on on the Discord, for sure. Um, okay, so... We are about an hour 19, which is, I mean, time flies. And this is, I always say this, yeah. you know, whenever we're talking mutants and masterminds, we could do this for three hours, my friend. I mean, I, I'm really enjoying the conversation, but I want to get in. Anything else that we're missing? Any other thing that you want to touch on before we? No, but there was a point that I know that you wanted to touch on. And so uh, let's do that, please. Okay. Sounds good. What I want to touch on is 
<laughs> this change log. Talk, talk to me about okay. So I, I've seen a character cheat too in my time, and uh, especially associated with the drafting table. Um, you have got this is this is quite a historical record of things that have gone on. Like, are they actual? Tell me what this is. Okay, so that's the change log of all the PowerPoints that I've earned and spent. Uh, I there that I earned as a GM running games, or that I've earned uh, playing in games as Spibby. And in fact, that character sheet doesn't even cover all of them. After while, Hero Lab doesn't even include all the points. It just stopped after a while. And so I had to create a Google Doc just to continue. But I found this was really important to be able to uh, keep track of how she spent her points because it's really uh, easy to lose track of, of like, okay, I bumped up her skill from like six to eight. Uh, I bumped up uh, this power or I removed this flaw. And it's really a testament to both her growth and the fantastic games that she's been in or that I've run. And that, yeah, like you can see all of the wonderful GMs uh, that have hosted games for her. Uh, Cosmic Bobby, Mad Tinkerer, uh, Suntails, um, Bookkeeper. Uh, these are all Sukami Baka, these are all wonderful people who run games and that she's been in and that she will hopefully continue to play in. And yeah, that's, I that's love that. part of her sheet. I think it's great. And I, I, it's not always something that I've seen. And I also just happen to uh, be looking at your changelog doc. Um, I can see, you know, how, how lengthy um, that this, uh, that this goes, but here's my question for you. Um, there's only one missing element here. And uh, one of the things, and I'm not saying you need to change anything, but this change log, what's the start date for it? Uh, so that's one thing that I did omit because I, my record keeping could improve. Um, <laughs> reason Now the reason why I omitted those or the date uh, wasn't, uh, intentional, but we have really good record keeping uh, because it's a Discord server. So I yeah. can look up the name of uh, those games on the server and the search function and find the dates uh, and put them. And some of the reason why I didn't include them are because she played in play by post games, which can take months. But I digress. And <laughs> Uh, so it's like, <laughs> uh, do you put the date of when it started or when it finished? Uh, <laughs> right. So that's right. Well, I guess that does sort of create a bit of a, cause you can, you can do several play by post games mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. I mean, how do you justify yes. that? Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Now, granted, but, be careful with that. Uh, when you when you're using a character in multiple games, try to have a good idea of what the timeline is, and if need be, uh, make sure to talk with the GMs about having your character in multiple games, and to make sure, like, hey, maybe the GM is planning on throwing your character into space, or or into a portal into some. Uh, legally distinct hack. Uh, maybe talk it over and make sure it's like, uh, can they appear for that birthday party game? Sure. Yeah, make, make sure that you, yeah, have a talk with your GMs and like be honest with them. You're collectively telling a story and you want the timeline to still kind of make sense. And oftentimes with play by post, there is wiggle room of like, when did it happen in game? And it's like, you can kind of like squeeze it in, but, but as sure. a player, yeah, always be mindful of uh, where your character is in, in a temporal way. Yeah. You know that it's an, it's another axis where you definitely, we don't have to worry about that as much, you know, in, in our day to day, because we really are just moving forward in the, in the slowest uh, time machine, you know, um, one second at a time. Whereas your character can be hopping up all over the place in, you know, all kinds of different, you know, 
times, worlds, uh, realities. And, uh, and so I bet that could make uh, record keeping a little challenging. But uh, I am curious, when we look at the, um, the, the very first PowerPoint that you earned, um, uh, checks and balances, mm-hmm. um, that, what date was that? I'm just curious in general. Oh boy, that was, um, let's see. Um, I am searching for it now because I can't, is, I can't go on without it. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm just dying to know. And I, I hope that you appreciate the pun because it was a bank robbery game. <laughs> I was going to ask. I do enjoy that. Well, you know, uh, I am in the U S and so we don't have, uh, the check, the check use. The check was. Ah, so apparently, uh, when I ran this game, it was March uh, 6th, uh, 2022. Now, 2022. I had the server for longer, but, you know, lost my original account. Hopefully someday I'll get it back again. Uh, if I ever enter in that uh, 2FA uh number it's right. like winning the lottery but but we'll see I, i'm maintaining hope um and so yes that that was a game that i ran as a gm and oftentimes uh when i am running uh games that i include as a gm pc or uh, i will give her those powerpoints makes the most sense it like yeah if she appeared in a game uh she appeared in a game uh let's see uh not baptism by fire not hunting reflections um oh what what was it called it, in your wildest dreams uh that was her first game where she was actually introduced into the setting at that point and it was a furry convention in freedom city as the <laughs> idea of the idea of fuzzy or scaly um heroes uh showing up to or whether they were mutated or born that way, showing up to a furry convention was uh, very interesting to run. Uh, yeah, I bet it was. I bet it was a lot of fun. Yes, uh, that featured the canon villain Mother Moonlight, who granted someone's wish, hence the uh, title In Your Wildest Dreams. Ah, I see, I see. And oftentimes your wildest dreams can become your worst nightmares. Um, or other people's nightmares if they have to fight you. That's right. Yeah, you can be, you can impose on other people's uh, uh, day mares, nightmares, uh, afternoon mares, the whole thing. Um, all right, listen, I got to tell you, my friend, um, as I've said, I, I've I've had a chat with several folks as we do these Drafting tables, um, and I, I just every time is a wonderful time to really get in to the the meta, the the sort of w- w- this whole thing is about going into the weeds and really breaking down why uh, character creation is what it is, but that there's some real opportunity to add depth and care and concern and. It feels to me as well, the more that I have these conversations, that there is a bit of of personal sort of, um, you know, taking care of yourself and, and, and those sorts of things. But it's almost like a therapeutic moments of being able to express aspects of yourself to be able to um, create opportunities to onboard people you know to these experiences to be more useful and and uh and to feel contributory in a big way to other people's stories there's something very connective and Mm -hmm. and i think um you know again a, a therapeutic way of just sort of saying there can be challenges and struggles and i'm going to contribute to uh, the telling of a good story by creating a character who's got those levers that that the GM can use, but also to the benefit of the party, you know, of the people, of the other heroes. Uh, uh, I think you've done a really great job of that here. Thank you. There's definitely a reason why 
narrative therapy and role playing are used as therapeutic modalities because there are a lot of elements where you can safely explore stories and to be able to like process things or be able to explore topics and areas that you normally might not be able to but in the safe environment of role playing you can and you oftentimes these games can have some difficult subject matter of course that are like properly flagged uh, so that players know what they're getting into but that it role playing really helps you explore and be in someone else's shoes even fuzzy like Spibby's case <laughs> and just being able to really see other people and to uh, explore stories at an emotional depth where you might not be able to and especially on the server and especially with mutants and masterminds where you can make a character that really fits your imagination and i use that opportunity to make a kind-hearted and warm and fuzzy character that uh, really just wants to help people you know, I see that. I feel that. Um, I would have Spibby on my team in a heartbeat. Um, absolutely a hero. And I got to tell you, my friend, Glyph, username, um, what a delight. I really appreciate that you were willing to step forward and kind of take the time. Um, I know that this is unusual. It's sort of a, it's a different sort of thing. And it's a spotlight that's on you. And, uh, and you've really, uh, you've really done it. I, I really want to thank you for your time. And, uh, and for just walking us through all things uh, Raquel, Una, uh, alias Spibby. Um, I hope you had a good time. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, Troy, as I find that the this series is really fun because it really gives an opportunity to show others of like, how did you make a character? How did you come up with that? And just gives me the opportunity to be able to share that. So thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, friends, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we're a regular, uh, series. We've got many, many people who are, uh, lined up and raring to go to share their characters, but there's always space for more. And if you are hanging out and you're listening, you're thinking, you know, I really do want to share my mutants and masterminds hero and the creation uh, and the genesis and all of the the juicy bits and walk into the weeds with me as I dig through your character and and we just discover not only what makes you know mutants and masterminds one of the most fun and uh, flexible TTRPGs out there, but also get a little bit into who you are. Um, uh, you can send a note to let's play at greenronin.com. So L E T S play at greenronin.com and you can hang out here and we can have a conversation and we can go as deep or as surface uh, as you like. Um, but again, my thanks to username, um, AKA Glyph, uh, as you may have heard him referred to, but I do appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much. And thank you.